Welcome, everybody. I want to thank the organizers and the woman over here on the uh, transcriber who I did a, uh, a check with first to make sure she could understand my accent. She said she's doing great as long as there's no Scots here. <laughs> <laughs> um, small crowd today, and this is fantastic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a couple things a little different. I've called, as we would say in American football, I've called an audible. I'm going to change what I'm doing a little bit, and I'm going to give you guys my idea is that I'm going to share with you, but I'm going to do something else. I'm going to share you some cheat tricks for doing conference presentations. I do a lot of these, and these are really, like, there's a couple of design patterns that make this work really well. And since we're a small group, and it's Sunday, and I couldn't get anybody to leave it, lead us in prayer or do a scripture reading, I'm just going to teach you some insider tricks, right? So the first insider trick is if you try to use your timer on your iPhone when you're timing yourself when you talk, it goes blank, right? Because your iPhone screen time's out. So you go to the YouTube app, you put in your time and say like 40 minute timer and, and you get a little timer countdown and you start that playing and the app won't let it go blank. It'll stay up there. And it's just like so much faster and easier than finding the app that will hold your screen open and all this and that you'll use twice a year, right? So I just go to YouTube and do that. So that's, that's my first hack. I'll give you my second hack. My second hack is the most common mistake at a conference presentation is to think that you are lecturing for teaching. And we are not lecturing for teaching. I am doing an advertisement, right? And I am either advertising a software library that I think you should go home and figure out more about or a way of doing like graphics that I think you should investigate or some abstract idea. Now today, I'm going to give you some abstract ideas. I'm going to show you no code, but I'm going to talk to you about some things, some ideas that I think will make you code better regardless of your language. Right? So when you do conference presentations, set your timer and keep in mind that I'm not teaching I'm not wanting somebody to walk out of here and be able to have no syntax, right? That's a four-hour session, and we do those upstairs, right? And we had, went to a great one yesterday on Quarto. It was fantastic, but it takes a three-hour block because you got to kind of iterate and try, and if you're just lecturing, you're not getting there. So because we're just doing an advertisement, we can do stuff kind of backwards, like we can lead with the big idea, which you maybe if you were teaching, you feel like you have to build to the big idea if you're doing an advertisement, you lead with it, right? So I know a bunch of things about boiling ideas down because <clears throat> I have adult ADHD. And Twitter has been a fantastic venue for someone with ADHD because it forces you to be fast and short. And that's kind of my MO. Many of you guys may know me. I know a lot of folks know me from uh, Twitter. I'm also a co-author of, of the Our Cookbook. Um, now, I think this is a vibe we're all sort of feeling. Like, let's go to Mastodon and let's all go together. We're open source people. We really belong better over there. I think it's probably healthy, you know, periodically to just burn your social graph down online and move it to another platform. I think good things happen there. So if you guys want to find me over on the Mastodon machine, I'm at cmastication at mastodon.social. Um, would, would love to connect with you guys there and keep in touch. Now, one thing you should know about me is I love Lego. Like, not just like Lego, like as a child, I slept with a picture of this Lego kit under my bed when I was like seven years old. I turned 50 last week. So when I would, this came out in 1977, Santa Claus brought this to me in 1980 and it was the best Christmas morning of my childhood. And I, my only ever bad memories of Christmas were Christmases where I didn't ask Santa Claus for Lego and then greatly regretted it. And what was so amazing about this Lego kit is it had the little motor with the square pistons that went up and down and it had a transmission that I could shift through multiple gears and forward and reverse. You know, and I was eight years old, so later I took physics and I discovered that some of my classmates thought the engines spun in reverse when you put the car in reverse and I couldn't believe how they were so stupid because I had been building transmissions since I was eight years old. Lego was glorious, and, and the Lego of the OG Lego of my days, you didn't build just one model, you built the other stuff too, and you didn't just put it on your shelf, you then took it apart and built something that was a bastard amalgamation of all these things, and it was glorious. So in 2001, 
in Nature Magazine, Adams, Converse, Hales, and Klotz, rolls off the tongue, had this uh, study that involved Legos. So I was naturally drawn to it because I love Legos. They had this diagram, and you can kind of see here they've got this uh, flat piece, and it's kind of cantilevered over, and they've got this figurine. I'll show you a screen of the actual one in a minute. I've got two different views because it's a little hard to tell. The big takeaway here is the top piece is cantilevered. And they told the people in the study, said, hey, we need you to make this stable so we can put this brick on top of here. How do you do it? What's the simplest way you can stabilize this so that the brick can sit on top of the platform and not crush the figurine? And they sort of give them to it open-ended, and then they say, Here, here's how it actually looked in practice, but I was afraid we couldn't tell the cantilever was there in this picture. So they said, okay, we'll give you a dollar to solve this, and each additional block cost you 10 cents. So let's do the exercise in our heads. Pretend you're there with a the researcher. They gave you this handful of, of blocks. They gave you this, and they said, a dollar to solve this problem. Each additional block costs 10 cents. We want to be able to support a brick on top of the platform. How do you do it? So think in your head. Picture how you would do it. Now, what if I told you removing a block has no cost as your prompt? Did you change your approach when I said that? Who in here will admit that my prompt changed their tact? That's not inconsistent with the results they found. Small prompt. Anybody want to yell out how they changed their Approach? Yeah, take away the green one, right? The immediate, most people's immediate. Now, by the way, every one of you were actually lightly prompted before I started talking because I did this. And I was actually a little bit afraid this gimmick wasn't going to work that I just did because this was going to be so heavy of a prompt that everybody would already be in the mindset of subtractive thinking, of shortening, making things less, right? So this, I was a little risky coming up here and uh, sharing it this way, but I was glad everybody didn't ingest this. Um, so the big surprise kind of was how biased we are to additive thinking instead of subtractive thinking. That was a little bit of surprise. But the bigger surprise was that to get people unanchored from additive thinking, it really just takes a bit of a nudge. Now, they found, situ they tested a whole bunch of stuff, right? So they tested recipes, like how do you make this recipe better? And it's really hard for people to think about subtracting something from a recipe unless there's an ingredient in the recipe that is gratuitous, you know, like sardines in the dessert, kind of gratuitous, <laughs> mustard in something that's supposed to, you know, when it was really gratuitous, people would think subtractive. Otherwise, really default to just adding things, adding an ingredient. Very strong bias. They, they also did this with vacation plans. So they gave people imaginary vacation plans and said, how would you make this better? And we can all relate to this, right? Because the way to make a vacation better is to see one more waterfall or go to an additional beach when actually in practice, often the thing to do is slow down, enjoy one waterfall longer, maybe not see as many waterfalls, take a longer hike, not more location hikes, right? But we had to be prompted. People had to be prompted in these studies in order to think of solutions that were subtractive instead of additive. In the words of my 15-year-old, cool story, bro, but why do we care, right? So I just did a little gimmick, right? It's stuck in your head. Now I'm going to do the meta thing. This is like explaining what I'm doing up here on stage. I did this thing where I had a surprise, right? And the surprise was I took you guys down the journey, and then I said, okay, I did the prompt with you, and you said, oh, yeah, wow, I see that. You know, I did the Malcolm Gladwell trick where I made you say, aha. Uh -huh. Well, that's all great, but how does it apply to us as people doing software and solving problems with software. So for the rest of this, I want to take us through a little romp of how this applies to us and the things we do with computers. So what makes minimum viable products, MVPs, so hot? Um, who in here has seen this picture or one similar to it? 
pretty ubiquitous. There's a few hands that aren't up, so let me just give a quick explanation. This comes from, uh, this actual diagram comes from Henry Kinberg's What is Scrum? So sort of Scrum slash Agile, and we're not going to thin slice differences. But the idea is, instead of like setting out on the top to incrementally build the perfect car, but all along the path have something that isn't usable and doesn't make anyone happy. But at the end, we have the perfect car. Instead of doing that, we should build things, and especially software, so that we have a little something useful at each step that gets more and more useful so that it's not useless at the very beginning. It isn't the ideal, it isn't where we're ultimately going, but it's helpful and useful to people. Um, this is an exercise, this is really a prompt or a hack for reductive thinking or subtractive thinking. Because we all can come in and, and you know, if you do this in a business context, we think about business users, they all have number four in mind. And one of the things we do with them is try to say, how do we think about what is one or two? What is the smallest thing we can produce that is still positive usefulness, that it still has some usefulness? And then we say, what's the next incremental improvement we can make to make that more useful? This is all just a big hack to say, what can we reduce? What can we subtract? How do we get here? So, you know, we did the aha earlier where we talked about subtractive thinking needing a prompt. This is such a wonderful idea of uh, subtractive thinking prompt. So use minimum viable products. Uh, I work at Renaissance Re. We got a number of folks from Renry here. We got a booth out there. Uh, we talk about these. Like what's the, you know, and it sounds a little weird to say, like what's the least I could do that's useful? That's the way I sometimes phrase the prompt. Slightly different exercise, but very similar. What's the least we could do? So it's all a subtractive prompt. Um, th let me share an experience from over on, on the Twitter machine. Some folks found this hilarious. Please forgive the spelling mistakes. Um, so I read this long answer on Stack Overflow, and it was actually ab about pandas. And I got through it, and I was like, wow, I just really learned some cool stuff. And I got down to the bottom and saw I was reading my own answer from eight years ago. <laughs> On the one hand, I was like, God damn, I used to be smart. And on the other hand, I was like, what? How did I not realize I wrote this? So I, I, the reason that, that this agricultural economist who's standing in front of you, who isn't a software developer, has this stupid high uh, score, whatever that is, magic internet points on Stack Overflow, is totally a quirk of timing. I learned the R language right before or right about the same time Stack Overflow was starting. And I got involved in helping seed Stack Overflow with good beginner R questions. Because many of us who had just learned were like, wow, the R help list is not overly helpful. It's very harsh towards learners and lots of RTFM and that sort of thing, right? A little bit abrasive. So we said, great, let's take every beginner question we can think of. Let's put it in Stack Overflow. We had somebody else else, a uh, different group of people who immediately went in and answered them. So we seeded the field with good questions and answers. And as a result, even though I probably haven't asked or answered a question on Stack Overflow in over five years, right, all those beginner questions accumulate sort of up points and everything, right? All right, so that's just the background to tell you why that number is kind of stupid big for a guy with my background. But I learned some things in that process. So one of the most important things I learned uh, in that process was a thing that, that the R community and, and other communities as well have begun calling Reprex, a reproducible example, and it's really a minimal Reprex. It's a chunk of code that can literally be copied out of one place pasted into your environment, run, and you can see the problem the other person is having. This is incredibly powerful. So that means you gotta do a few things, right? Like, so if you're trying to do a, um, 
a data frame transform of some kind, you've got to have code in there that makes the example data frame. And the pandas documentation is fantastic about this, right? They, you can copy that and run it in your own environment and actually see the data frame and see the steps they do and change it just a little bit and see that you get a different result. This is incredibly useful as a concept, and I learned this uh, writing Stack Overflow questions. And um, I think it is a critical tech skill, not just for asking questions online, although for asking questions online, but also for debugging. So who in here is familiar with rubber duck debugging? Almost everybody, quick summary is, you, and, and I do this with my analyst after their first accepted pull request, they get a rubber ducky. The idea is when you have a technical problem, you explain it to the rubber ducky, and it is shocking that the rubber ducky often solves the problem for you, and the obvious hack here is just by articulating your problem, you see what's wrong with it, and an inanimate object is enough to help you be able to do that. Well, what's interesting is the next version of rubber duck debugging, when the rubber duck doesn't work, you create a reprex to share either with your colleague or share online. So you say, okay, in the middle of all this code, I have this one thing. So I'm gonna make an example data uh, frame or whatever list, uh, Dick, that's sort of not my real data, but shaped like it. And then I'm gonna try to do the thing I need to do. And I'm gonna illustrate the problem I'm having. And ah, I solved it before I even ask them, right? Because in the process of reducing the problem down to just a few lines of code, you often see the problem that you couldn't see because the noise of all your other code was in the way. So just like the rubber duck, often the reproducible example, the creating of it before you even share it with anyone else, you solve your own problem. And the glory is if you don't solve your own problem, you will get one of two things. You will either have a reproducible example that you can send to Vish and he will solve your problem, or you have a reproducible example which you will put in a bug report or a GitHub issue or somewhere else that crisply and cleanly illustrates you found a bug. The problem isn't you, the problem was the tool you were using isn't behaving the way you expected or whatever. So it gets more eyes on the problem but it also helps you think cleaner about the problem. Now, you don't need to be able to read what's up here. The idea is I want to tell a little story, and this is, this is my other, you know, storytelling trick I'm up here, is my slides are prompts for stories. So we had uh, some work we did at Renaissance Re where we were trying to do effectively really big joins on highly, highly skewed cardinality data at scale, and it was making a bunch of tools break. Because you get big enough and everything sort of falls over and everything becomes an I.O. issue and things run out of memory. And so we said, okay, we'll try a few different platforms. You know, we'll do this in, in Spark. We want to do this in Dask. And a few of us had played with Dask, but we hadn't really used it in anger. And so we said, what if we think we're doing it right in Dask, but we're really missing the basics? So we went to the uh, group Coiled, and they offer uh, commercial support and a platform for doing Dask. And we said, look, we want to pay you money to help us do a POC. And we want to pay you money because we want to make sure that even if we don't use your tool, you all feel like this is a happy relationship. And I think that's important. And at the, the end, they looked at us and we said, we get what your problem is, we see the problem, and we think right now, uh, Dask slash Coiled isn't the right tool compared to some of the others you look at. So interestingly enough, this isn't the point of my story, but talk about a vendor that I want to do business with again, right? Anybody that will tell me, I think our tool is not the right one for you, has so much credibility, right? Because I feel like they've been incredibly honest with me, so I can't wait for my next project with them. Um, two, they asked me, and actually I got, my, uh, I got my SciPy shirt on. I was hanging out at SciPy in Austin this year and sat down with the CEO of Coiled, and he said, can we actually create a, a uh, example, like a test case from your data. And I was like, nah, we anonymized it, but we don't really want to share our data. And he's like, well, what can we do then? I said, how about 
I create code that makes data that has the characteristics of our data. Because the problem was it wasn't just size. It was that the groupings were imbalanced and grossly imbalanced. Some of the groupings had five things in them and some had 5,000. And so this made shuffling problems really bad. So anyway, it had some weird quirk. And so I worked with the Coiled crew in open source community to make example test case Oh, beginning to feel like a reprex, right? I, now, we had to do a lot of code to get data that was the right shape, but it produced a reproducible example that the Dask community could use as a reference case for testing improvements to Dask and test how does Dask behave with these class of problems, and it was tremendously valuable. And the reason we thought to do that was our experience with reproducible examples uh, led us in that direction. So huge positive outcome for us. Also, Dask is going to be better uh, because of it. All right, so who in here knows who Adam Savage is? Myth, Mythbuster guy? Okay, cool. Want to make sure cultural references traverse the Atlantic. <laughs> Um, highly recommend reading his book, every, every Tool's a Hammer, right? That spirit appeals to me. I grew up on a farm, and every tool is a hammer when you're in the middle of a field with broken equipment. Um, one of the things that really jumped out at me when I was reading it, it's Adam Savage's book, is he has a section in there where he talked about everything. He's, he's a prolific builder, and he talks about every model and everything he has built. He when he starts the build, he buys three times the material he needs. The reason he buys three times is the first build is a little bit to make work, finish working the idea out. He's 90% there, but you work the last 10% out. And that build has a lot of rework in it. It's rough around the edges. And then his second build, he's worked a lot of the kinks out of the design, but now he's working on some of the process. So he builds number two, and it's good. But number two isn't camera ready, and his background is as a prop maker for movies. So he knows after he builds the second one, it's not going to be perfect. So he builds the third one, and it's, it's camera ready. It's worked all the kinks out. Now, I don't do stuff that has camera ready, so maybe I just have to build two, right? Because I may be fine at two. But the point is, as a builder of things, I think a young version of me, right, the 25-year-old me, not the 50-year-old me, the 25-year-old me thought that thing I built when I built it should be really, really good. And I'm realizing as I get older, that's actually unreasonable expectation. There should always be at least two, maybe three versions. This is true for subtractive thinking as well. So we build the first piece, and we actually learn what we can remove if we have prompted ourselves or we have prompted our team to think about, okay, now that we have kind of a prototype, let's think through this minimum viable pro product idea and say, is there less we could do? Is there a way we could simplify this? And what you'll, if you practice this, you will begin to see that you will discover areas you can actually reduce things. Or maybe you group your functions differently. Or my favorite type of reductive thinking in code is use someone else's library, right? Using a library is a as opposed to building it yourself, using another library or a framework is a type of subtractive thinking. It's code that I don't have to maintain and write. So let me just repeat myself. Um, subtractive thinking is not our default. It's hard. And we did an example of that and thought through it. So as a result, we have to have prompting. We should prompt each other. We should prompt our team. We should even prompt ourselves to think about subtracting thinking. MVPs are great prompts to think about reducing. And revisit your MVP as you go through it. Don't just set your MVP in place and think that's static. That can change as you learn new ways to reduce. Uh, reproducible examples is a critical meta, I've got, a, I've got a verb agreement problem there, I apologize. These are critical meta skills, so making these examples are, uh, is a critical skill. Refactor for simplicity, so when you refactor, don't just think refactor, you know, to make it cleaner code or add comments or whatever, also think reproduce, uh, sorry, refactor for simplicity to make it simpler. Um, taking out code and using a library 
is incredibly subtractive and a super uh, useful way to make your code less. So um, I just want to point out here, we've got job openings at Renaissance Re, where a few of us work. Feel free to scan the QR code or visit the folks out here at the table. We've got little QR codes on a, on a note card. Take you to our, uh, to our job listings. Uh, we would love you guys to come work with us and help us reduce complicated things uh, and, ma and make them more simple. Now, according to my clock, got a few minutes left, right? And that's by design. I wanted to see if there's any uh, questions about this that I could take from you all. Do we have a microphone or you just need to talk loud? No micro, oh, we got one in the back. Vish is gonna go grab the microphone, we're gonna do Q&A, and y'all are gonna play Stump the Chump. Any questions? I'll call over to you. No? So, I'll start. Great, go for it, Vish. If you can go back one slide, please. I kinda disagree with the last point. Great, challenge me, Vish. Yeah. This is what it's like working with us, by the way. Hold that mic close so they can hear so, you. I used to have a mantra going, other people's code is better than my code, because I like writing code, so I used to have to repeat this myself constantly to get in the habit of using libraries and not have not invented here syndrome. But I've changed my tune on that. <gasps> I, for a whole different set of reasons. Other people write a, write a lot more code than I do, and every line of code is a liability. So, don't use a library when you're going to import 10,000 lines of code. Maybe you only need to write 100. Okay, so good point. And let me, let me, okay, this is a great tension, right? And without any planning, we have produced an interesting human tension, which makes for good conference discussion, right? Let's describe what's going on here. Part of it is he's got a lot more skill than I do, right? Let's go ahead and acknowledge that. So his 100 lines of code will be skillful code. I, I might never get there if I had to write those code. So first of all is know your personal limitations, right? Like I believe that his 100 lines of code would replace 1,000, I would not be able to write those 100 lines of code to replace the 1,000. So know your limitations. Uh, two is there is clearly a balance here, right? So if you need one uh, function from one library, you, you may not want to import the whole big library in order to get just one function. You may want to re-implement that. Now, what I would do is I'd probably import the library unless size was a problem. Like, unless I was needing to deploy this on an AWS Lambda and I really was concerned about size, in which case I'd just go to the source code and I'd steal that function, right? <laughs> and I'd put that in my code with a link from where to where I got it, right? And that's kind of okay, right? We're not, I'm not selling this software, I'm using it internally. Uh, that's a legitimate way to work around this. Or I would work with Vish, right? to come up with a parsimonious solution that we owned. Um, that usually isn't the error that most people make. Most people make the, most professional developers that I work with have a tendency to just start building code before they even survey maybe what libraries are already available that they could just be using. Um, and so I think this is more just a nudge to think about that balance. And we have, we have talked about the two maybe extremes and most of our life will be somewhere in the middle. Is that fair, oh, Vish? Oh yeah, no, it's completely fair. It was just, I just wanted to But I appreciate the drama. I appreciate <laughs> the setting up tension. I like it. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, how do you think about uh, choice of languages and tools and frameworks for different jobs? Like, I guess sometimes it's customer driven, but these yeah. days with you know, a lot of new things coming along like Rust and you know, how do you think about when to choose Python and then within Python, which frameworks, like you mentioned Das versus Spark. So I'd just be interested in your, your, your choice process. Yeah, so the, the, yeah, the question about how do, you, how do you think about choice of language, um, I think one thing that's increasingly obvious to me, and I have thought this for years, the future is polyglot. I really believe that. And we see that here. We had, um, had uh, Liam presenting Polar's uh, next door yesterday morning, and it's a Rust project. It's got, an, it's got a Python interface, and there's, a, there's an R interface in, pro, in process for that. Like, that's a neat idea because it's got this thin interface between the two languages. Um, what I think of every time somebody asks me this question is my uh, father 
was retired uh, from the U.S. Air Force, and I grew up on a farm, but he was a, was a reservist in the Air Force, and so he would go back and do his work in the Air Force, and it was all around computers and information technology. So he was kind of farmer by day, and you know, every month he'd go be a military IT specialist for a while. And people would ask him, oh, what, you know, what type of computer should I get? Should I get Mac? Should I get, you know, a PC? This was pre-Windows even, right? And, and they would say, you know, or, or, you know, a TI-99 4A. We go way back. I did say I'm 50. Um, and he would say, the first factor is, what do your friends use? Because you're going to need somebody you can talk to about it, somebody you're going to share floppy disks with. Uh, and so there's something, you know, some part of why I use more Python now than I used to is I'm working closer with a team that all uses Python. So a big chunk of it is, what's the neighborhood using? And that neighborhood could be work, it could be social, whatever. Uh, another is like which, I talk, about, I talk about tools that fit my hand. I like visual, physical metaphors. And often one tool has a better fit for the job. And so when I first tried to learn Python, the data frame didn't exist. Pandas hadn't been written yet by Wes McKinney. And I wanted to do what was basically read a CSV, do a group buy. And I looked at what that took to get that done in Python before Pandas, and so I learned R, because R, R had a data frame, and they had a construct for doing group buys, and it just was the tool that fit my hand as a data analyst type, right? I'm not a software developer. That tool fit my hand a lot better. With the advent of the data frame, we see that Python now becomes a tool that fits a lot more hands. There's probably been no single library that has driven more adoption of any piece of software than Pandas driving adoption of Python. And if you aren't in the, like, the really like, data science-y adjacent sort of areas, that may sound really ridiculous. And if you're in like the super data-focused data science areas, it sounds terribly obvious. So just FYI, depending on where you find yourself there. Um, so some of it is what tool fits, but only after you think about what team you're in, I think. And then the other is, what's the interface? So like, I don't have any problems using Polars, which was mentioned yesterday, even though it's a Rust project, because they've got such a good interface. So our Python can play with it, and it effectively becomes like a service. And towards that end, everything I'm using over an AWS, Glue, Athena, all that junk's Python under the covers. And I often don't even know that unless it sneaks through the error messages. I make a lot of error messages. Um, you can kind of see in the error messages, oh yeah, this is Java, I forgot, right? Or I use Dremio, but it's, I'm using them like appliances. And so sometimes we use these appliances, and you can think of polars like an appliance. I'm using these appliances through libraries. Uh, I kind of don't care what they're written in. So sometimes we can write little piece of it in a language that's the right tool for the job, but interface with it in the primary language that our, that our team uses. I'm just about out of time. Do we have one more question? Maybe, yeah, just one quick question. Oh, yeah, okay. Hey, great speech, thanks very much. Um, MVPs. Yes. Uh, how do you deal with that tension where the, the minimum part of what you produce you know, isn't truly useful? Mm -hmm. And you're trying to, to go from that kind of skateboard, scooter, all the way up to the car. And you're never getting that skateboard, scooter, bike released. Right. So they're never actually using it. How do you, how do, you do with that friction? So I think every, you know, this is a little bit like every happy family is same and every unhappy family is unhappy in their special way. I'm hesitant to answer that question because I know that every team that can't get a useful MVP is probably struggling in a different way than every other one, would be my intuition, right? But I can tell you some design patterns I have seen. S some of it is too many hops between the, the makers and the users. And if you have lots of hops, you, hops meaning you know, multiple people that you're whispering through, if you have lots of hops, what is most useful gets lost in the chain of discussion. And it not only is slow to communicate, it's also inaccurate. So you often think you're building something that's useful and it's not as useful as you thought it would be. So my single hack for that is either get the user community to sit in the desk with you or literally move your laptop to the desk with them and spend more time maybe even showing mock-ups on a dry erase board, maybe it's actually showing them code and talking through it, depends on the situation. And close that loop through 
direct communication between the builder and the user, that's usually the solution, or you'll at least figure out where the, um, where the impedance mismatch, because often this is some sort of impedance mismatch between the builders and, and the users. So that feels like a cop-out to say, talk to the users, but I think it's legitimate in my experience that uh, when we're having that, it doesn't quite fit together, right? Our Lego blocks feel the wrong size to snap together. When we're having that experience, it's usually been my experience to resolve it through higher fidelity conversation. Thank you all so much for having me.